There are so many things in mathematics that, although they would generally be considered incorrect, actually become correct when placed in some sort of higher level context. For this reason, the bell curve meme format has seen great use in mathematics and we have Calabi Yao Fan to thank for this one. Of course, everyone has some recollection of what parallel lines are from geometry class in school. Two lines are parallel if they exist in the same plane plane and do not meet. Just like these red lines here, they exist in the same plane and they don't meet. On the other hand, it's clear that the green lines here also in the same plane do meet. And so a dumb guy might say the green lines are parallel. But your average fella would be capable of correcting him and saying no, the green lines clearly intersect at a point. But then on the far end of the bell curve, those wise mathematical sorcerers who have lived, breathed, and smelled mathematics may say that indeed the green lines are parallel. Kugel Blitzka replied to this meme saying, I'm the midwit here, how are the lines parallel? Well, today I'm gonna tell you a little bit of finite geometry so you can understand why these lines are parallel and we'll even do a proof. Before we get into the geometry, I do feel I should cover the fact that also this sparked a little bit of a math meme war. Yes, shots were fired and lines were drawn when someone else countered with a fixed interpolation meme. Now it's the midwit who says, no, there's no explicit point where the green lines meet. So the green lines are clearly parallel. Well, both of our extremes agree, the, the green, green lines, lines intersect at a point. point. After looking at some of the heated discussion and commentary that followed, it seems that OP was not really disagreeing with the original meme, but more so having a laugh at this method of drawing the situation, which is what makes it possible for the confusion in the original meme to occur at all. But but ultimately, people made a bit of fun of him for not understanding the original meme. It reminds me of the time that I wrote pi like this for the sake of a meme, and instead of laughing at what I thought was a pretty funny meme, people just bullied me for writing pi like that. Regardless, this first counter meme confused people so much, not being sure if they were dumb, or the OP was dumb, or everybody's dumb, and then we got this final meme. <laughs> this is the fixed fixed math meme meme, where the midwit says, no, I I understand this meme better than you do. You're obviously in the middle. And our extreme characters say, what the, the f are, are you guys, guys talking, talking about? about? Altogether an amusing saga, but let's take a look at some geometry to understand why on earth we would consider these green lines to be parallel. In his legendary textbook, The Elements, Euclid set a standard for deductive mathematics. Here in book one, we begin with definitions and axioms. In essence, it's these axioms that fully specify the Euclidean geometry. And from these assumptions, Euclid deduces many, many classic theorems. In these definitions and axioms for Euclidean geometry, we can see a few interesting things. First, definition 35 tells us what parallel lines are. They're lines that are in the same plane and which being produced continually in both directions would never meet. A definition that the green lines from our meme certainly do not satisfy. They are in the same plane, but they absolutely meet. So just looking at the picture from the Euclidean perspective, they would not be parallel. What really jumps out at us if we look through the axioms, axiom 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc., is axiom 12. This is much longer and more complicated than the others, and in this translation is the only one that uses a picture to help clarify. This is the famous parallel postulate, and for a long time, mathematicians tried to use Euclid's other axioms to deduce this one, hoping that we wouldn't have to take such a long statement as an axiom in what is otherwise a fairly simple set of assumptions. All of those efforts failed until eventually it was discovered that there could be a consistent geometry where the negation of the parallel postulate was assumed. And so, while these green lines certainly wouldn't be parallel from the Euclidean perspective, it turned out that Euclidean geometry was just one quite specific type of geometry. By using different axioms, other consistent and surprisingly useful geometries could be developed and studied as well. Now, the one piece of context the OP gave besides the picture was the title, 
finite geometry mean? So let's consider finite geometries that take place in the plane. One type of finite plane geometry is what's called projective geometry. And here are the three axioms defining projective geometry as they appear in the O'Hara and Ward text on the subject. Axiom one is there is at least one line on which are both of two distinct points. Axiom two says there's not more than one line on which are both of two distinct points. And axiom three says there is at least one point which is on both of two distinct lines. For us, it's axiom three that's the key and tells us that this is not the geometry we are looking for. In fact, axiom three, if you read it closely, you realize it precludes the possibility of parallel lines. This says any two distinct lines must in fact share a point. This is often put in the real world context of observing railroad tracks. If I'm standing on a railroad and looking down the tracks, the tracks may appear to be parallel and to have some distance from each other when they're close to me, but as the distance from me grows, the railroad tracks would appear to meet at the horizon. And in its own way, axiom three of projective geometry captures this phenomenon. Projective geometry is interesting, but as we see, axiom three precludes it from applying to our situation. The other type of finite plane geometry is affine geometry, and this is the one that we are looking for. Affine comes from the Latin word affinis, which means to be connected or related to. For example, in affine geometry, I should really cut these things out. You know, it's funny, in first grade we had toads as pets, classroom pets. The teacher would take them out and they'd hop around on the desk. I'd kiss them all the time because I just loved toads and frogs. So they'd hop around and I'd pick them up and give them a smooch on the head. I don't know, it's, it's a miracle people didn't bully me. So as I was saying, in affine geometry, something called an affine transformation could transform this shape into this one. An affine transformation doesn't preserve distances and angles. For example, you can see these angles are different and certainly the lengths of those segments are different as well. However, it does preserve some important things that keep these shapes related or connected to each other. It preserves collinearity of points, for example, and also parallelism. These two lines were parallel before and they're parallel after. Same with these other two as well. So of course, affine geometry does have parallel lines and is in a sense, a finite form of our familiar Euclidean geometry. So now let's look at the axioms for affine geometry. Axiom one, for every two distinct points, there is exactly one line that contains both points. Axiom two, Given a line L and a point P not on L, there exists exactly one line, L prime, containing P that does not have a point in common with L. So the intersection of those lines is the empty set. They don't share a point. This is Playfair's axiom, which is a familiar form of Euclid's parallel postulate. It's often the one you would be taught in school that a point not on a line has exactly one line through it parallel to the given line. And then axiom three, which just guarantees we're not in a completely trivial geometry. There exists a set of four points no three of which are on the same line. Axiom three guarantees that the geometry doesn't consist of just a single line. Looking back at axiom one, this doesn't tell us that each line contains exactly two points, but that each line must contain at least two points. This means that the smallest affine geometry we could consider would be what's called order two, meaning that each line has that minimum two points. So this means if I wanna just sketch out some pictures to give me a sense of what this affine geometry of order two looks like, I could draw some points on the plane and certainly any two points would belong to exactly one line. So for example, these two points would have to, because of axiom one, belong to a line. Drawing things out this way is helpful, but of course, if you don't know the context, this can be quite deceptive. Since the line just is these two points, drawing it like this is helpful to see that these two points are connected by the fact that they lie on a line. But it's also deceptive because it makes the line look more significant than it is. Of course, I could just as well draw the line that connects these two dots. They're two dots, so by axiom one, they must belong to a line. But now, of course, our 
drawing has made it appear to our Euclidean intuition that the lines intersect. But that's not the case. This isn't a point in our affine geometry of order two. In fact, in an affine geometry of order two, the picture that we saw before, which I am now recreating, is everything. This is the entire affine geometry of order two. It has exactly four points and we don't get control over that fact. Everything here is color coded based on the same color lines being parallel. The blue lines and the red lines appear parallel in the traditional sense, but they are parallel in this context simply because they don't share a point, the points being the four black dots. By the same reasoning, the green lines, even though they don't appear parallel in the traditional sense, are parallel because again, they don't share a point. Not only is there not a point here in the picture, but like I said previously, there in fact could not possibly be a point here. Four points is all this space can have. And I want to finish by using our axioms for affine geometry to prove that fact. We're going to prove that an affine geometry of order two has exactly four points by proving the more general statement that an affine geometry of order n has n squared points. And remember that the order of a finite affine plane is the number of points on a line in that plane. And this proof is from the Joy Morris book on combinatorics. Link in the description if you want to check it out. Now, remember from Axiom 3, we're guaranteed a set of four points, no three of which are on the same line. That means we're free to take three points that guaranteed are not collinear. And of course, each pair of these points defines a line. We'll call this one line L, and we'll call this other one L prime. And let's call this point they share point Q. Again, remember we're working in a finite affine plane. That means that these lines, although they're drawn to look like continuous objects, they have some finite number of points on them. That number is N. Of course, from axiom one, that number N of points on a line has to be at least two. And we've seen two of the points on L prime here. Thanks to axiom two, we know that there must be a line through this point on L prime that's not on L. There has to be a line through that point that's parallel to L. That's what axiom two tells us. Of course, because this is a finite geometry, in my picture, this parallel line doesn't necessarily have to look parallel to L, but of course it will be more useful for us to just draw it that way so that our intuition is consistent with reality. Now this line parallel to L, like all lines in the geometry, must have N points. And the N points it has are distinct from L's N points, because the lines are parallel. So on this line, we have N points. On the line L, we also have N points. In fact, in total, since L prime has N points, we should have N lines that are all parallel that each themselves have N points. That's because L goes through this point Q, but for all of the other N minus one points on L prime, that aren't on L, we can draw parallel lines through those points that are all parallel to L, again by axiom two. It's straightforward to show that if all these lines are drawn parallel to L, then they are all parallel to each other, but in total what we get is N lines, each with N points. If we have N lines with N points each, then certainly our geometry must consist of at least N squared points. So we've just shown how from axiom one and a little bit of use of the other axioms, we're guaranteed to need at least N squared points in our plane because of this simple construction. And in this argument, we counted all of the points on L in addition to a bunch of other points. So to finish the proof, let's consider any point that's not on L and then make sure that we counted it in the previous argument to establish that N squared points must in fact be the exact number in our plane. Just to keep things tidy, I've recreated our original instruction that used axiom one. We know our plane has three points that aren't all on the same line, so we're guaranteed to have at least these two lines, L and L prime, that intersect at Q. So like I said, we'll consider an arbitrary point that is not on L. Let's call that point little p. 
Then, again from Playfair's axiom, there must be a line through this point that is parallel to L. We'll go ahead and draw that line and call it big P. So there's our line through the point parallel to L. Remember from axiom two, we know not just that these parallel lines exist, but that there's exactly one such line in each case. This means that as far as lines that pass through Q go, this is the only one that's parallel to P. L is the only line through Q that's parallel to P. That means that L prime is not parallel to P, and so drawing them as if they've intersected was actually valid and not misleading. They must in fact intersect at some point because L prime goes through Q, but the only line through Q parallel to P is L, not L prime. But then recall in the first part of our argument, we already counted every single point that was on a line that intersected L prime. That's how we made this construction. The idea was every point on L prime that's not on L, we construct a line through it parallel to L and we counted up all of those points. That means here where we consider this arbitrary point not on L, that was in fact a point that must have been counted in our original argument because it's a point on a line that intersects L prime. Thus establishing our original count of N squared, this was not in fact just a lower bound, but actually all of the points total in the plane. So yes, the green lines are parallel. They don't share a common point, and in the finite affine plane of order two, this is the full picture. Nothing else can be here. Nothing else is here. While some people might argue this is a pretty cruddy way to do the drawings because of how it could mislead people, it's not gonna mislead anybody who understands what they're studying. Of course, if you look at this totally out of context, it could be deceiving. Just like in graph theory, it's worth learning to ignore contextually irrelevant edge crossings so that you're able to draw your objects of study in the plane. And although it's quite a bit different from our beloved Euclidean geometry, it's a very interesting field all the same. Change doesn't have to be scary. Change doesn't have to be scary. Change doesn't have to be scary. Change doesn't have to be- ah! I'm unstable, I'm feeling hard to keep the cable cut an unsucked table. If Texas instruments don't reply, I think this time it might be fatal. I wish to sell my own fake, cause I'm jaded. Hate the odds that I calculated. Press and pull the brain. Push it all the way through the whole blue planet. Faded. Psycho.